We want to welcome those that are watching online, especially those from Lopez Prison. Come on, let's give it up for those folks. Great to have them with us. Now, now listen, today I, I'm going to share um, something a little different than when I had, you know, I worked all week on my message and then Friday morning on my day off, I get up and God just kind of wrecks me. And uh, so, you know, I know a little bit of where we're going because we already had one service, but I, I, I want to talk about really the power of God in your life. How, come on, how many want the power of God in your life? Amen. And, and um, you know, I, I, this kind of really kind of started a, a couple weeks ago. A young man asked me a question. He was moving to San Francisco and, he, and, and first he asked me if I knew of a church there and, and I said no. And he said, well, what should I look for in a church? I thought it was a great question. And, and I gave him two things. I said, number one, are they preaching the truth? Are they teaching the truth, the word of God? And I said, number two, you should experience the Holy Spirit. Yes. Let, let me say that again. Yes. You should experience the Holy Spirit. That, that's really, really important. Now, when we talk about experience the Holy Spirit, we're, we're not talking about goosebumps. We're not talking about an emotional thing. We're talking about something, and, and this is something that I think a lot of people who come to church don't understand, is that God desires to speak to your heart. You know, and so many people are coming to God and they're understanding God through their intellect and their emotions, and you can never do that. And, and what happens is it puts, it puts limits. See, when, 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 you, when you just go by the natural to understand God, what it'll do is it'll make adjustments in your life. When the Spirit of God speaks to you, guess what? It makes transformation. See, God wants to make a transformation in your life. He wants to radically change every area of your life for the good. He wants to inject peace and joy and, and this comfort in your life that no matter what's happened on the outside, when the storms are coming, all of a sudden man, on the inside, there's this supernatural peace. Jesus calls it his peace. He calls it his joy. He calls it his love. It surpasses anything you're feeling on this earth. See, that's what we need. That's what we have to have. I don't want church to be for you just something you come in, you experience. It doesn't really change your life. I want something when you come in, man, it radically wrecks you. How many of you are really willing to be wrecked this morning? Right? Amen. And, and I, I, want, I want to read a passage to you just to t just kind of kick into this. And it's John 16, 13. And, and, and it talks about Jesus is, is, is leaving He's, he's going to die, and he says the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he, he's going to really take my place. And, and he uses the word comforter, which means his, the helper. It's a lot more than that, but that's all the time we have to share with it today. And, and, and he talks about the job of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I read this, this verse, let me say this. I think so many times we think the Holy Spirit is basically, you know, he does miracles. Uh, we, we have this refreshing time. You know, we come into worship or something like that and we feel refreshed. And, and, and that is true. Those are great things. But you know what? Um, miracles by themselves don't change your lives. Now, I know people who've had miracles and fallen away from God. You know, miracles attract you to God. I know people who have a refreshing on Sunday, but by Wednesday, they're bombed out. See, there's something more that we need. And, 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 what it's, and this is, I believe, the number one job of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 in the New Living Testament says, when the spirit of truth comes. What is the truth? It's the word of God. See, the word of God by itself isn't life changing. When you take the word of God and then the spirit of God who reveals it to your heart, not to your head, not to your emotions, then it's life changing. It's transformative. And, and it goes on to say this. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Let me read this out of the Passion Translation. But when the truth giving spirit comes, he will unveil the reality of every truth within you. Now, now, let me just stop right there. That's the only part I want to read. He will take off the veil. I love that expression. Let, let, me, let, let me help you. Every problem that you're facing in life 
there's an answer from God on it. Let me say that again. Whatever you're dealing with right now, however horrible it seems, however bad it might be, how it looks like there's no answer, God has an answer. And, and, and it's wrapped in his word. Now, in the word, we may not have the answer for everything directly, but when you start reading the word and the spirit of truth takes that word and he opens it up to you and, and, and all of a sudden he shows you a way, and it doesn't mean that you're going to have instantaneous turnaround, but what it means is God's going to put you on a path where you're going to see transformation yes. every time. See, and, and what happens is when we look at the word of God and we look at it strictly from our intellect and our emotions, there's a veil on it. You, you, can't, you can't understand the word of God in totality with your mind and your emotions. You can't. And, and what the problem is, is that all of us are experts in the language of intellect and emotions. We're, we're experts in reasoning everything out. We're driven by our five physical senses. We're driven by the circumstances, what we feel, how it reasons out. And we let that dominate us. But see, faith and the Spirit of God, when we begin to tap into what he has, it's like the Spirit of God unveils the answer for you, and then you have to make a decision what you're going to do with it. Does that make sense? Now, now I, I want to break this down and make it really simple for you today. What, what is the language of the spirit? We know the language of the intellect is reason. We know when it comes to, to feelings, it's, it's our emotions and, and, and how, you know, how that drives us. But the language of the spirit is internal hope. It's when you stand or you, you, you stand in worship, you sit and you hear the word and something comes on you on the inside. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't change the circumstances at the moment. But right there, there's a spark of hope. It's like, you know what? Things can change. Things can be different. See, and, and what you do with what the Spirit shares with you determines the journey that you're going to go on. And it determines the outcome of your life. Right now, some of you are right in the middle of hopeless situations. And a lot of us, what we do is we just kind of cover it up, try to go through life, and we, we try to have things that just make us feel better because life in itself is so painful. God wants to turn that around. He wants to be the answer, not just so you go through it and struggle. He wants you to be an overcomer in every way, in every of your life. But, but see, you have to understand that something has to be different. You have to grab a hold of it. Now, I, I want to share something with that's very important. Every person that's ever been born on this earth, hope has spoken to them. May, they may not have recognized it. They may not know it's God. They may have known it's God and then just rejected it. But every person in this room, God's been speaking to, you wouldn't be here. You're not here by accident. You're not here because, oh, this is a cool place to be on Sunday morning. You're here at the end of the day because something's drawing you. And see, and, and the question is, what are you going to do with that? And, and one of the biggest problems we have in the church world is people feel that and then they look to their intellect and to their emotions for the answer. Well, God said that. Is it happening? Is it happening? Is it? They're looking for it, but they're looking for it in the natural realm. They're looking to feel that way. See, what you have to understand is that something completely different, and you know what it's called? The spirit of faith. See, faith gives evidence to hope. I'm glad that one connected well. All right, let's move on. It's all right. We're good. We're good. I'm good. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4.13. And I love this scripture. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written. Now listen to this. this these, what is that? Five words are so important. I believed, therefore I spoke. 
We also believe, therefore we also speak. I, I, I want you to notice something. You have to put a voice to hope. Yes. Now for some of you, this is really new. You have to put a voice to hope. You, you have to sit there and begin to sit there and go, okay, you know what? God's prompting me in the, in the heart. And, and now how I exercise my faith is I grab a hold of what's spoken and I declare to, I make a decision to believe it and I speak it and I do it. See, there's healing in the house for people who believe and speak it. There's restoration in your marriages for believe and speak. There, there's complete transformation in your life for those that will believe and speak. But some of you are struggling with faith because you're locked up so much in the language of, of intellect and emotions. And you have to make a decision to start saying, you know what, I'm going to start believing God. See, faith is bold. I said faith is bold. You know, um, I, I want to share this with you. You know, this, how, how, do I, how do I start this? On Friday morning, I, I, I was literally kind of just, you know, I, 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 sometimes you have rough patches in ministry. It's been a little bit of a rough patch lately. And, and on Friday morning, I was just getting before God. And I'm, I'm the type of person, I'm just like, God, what do you want? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And, and, and I don't have time to get into all the different things he's said to me over the last three days and spoken to me. But I look at the scripture, the spirit of faith. And, and what God said to me was that how important it is for us to begin to move and to operate in the spirit of faith. And the spirit of faith is on this church. See, when the spirit of faith moves and operates, it changes the environment. When the spirit of fear is operating, people get, they, they retreat and they huddle. When the spirit of faith is on you, you begin to step out and be bold. Yes. And so what God is saying, the spirit of faith is on this place. And it's a decision for each and every one of us to make, to say, I'm going to follow the spirit of faith, even for me. Yes. See, this church was birthed in the spirit of faith. I want to show you a picture, if you could show that, Daisy Wilbanks. This is so interesting. See, this church isn't brand new. This church started in the 1940s. And you know how it started? There was a woman who one day in heaven, I'm looking so forward to meet. She and I are connected. We've never met, but we're connected by the spirit of faith. And, and she was from Dallas in the 40s. And she felt in her heart a prompting to come down to the Rio Grande Valley in the 1940s. I want you to think about that for a second. Anybody been here, was in the Rio Grande Valley in the 40s? Okay, I don't see anybody. All right, maybe one. You know what? It was a different place. How many of you know that? I know it was a different place 28 years ago. I know it was a big, big different place. What was that, 80 years ago, whatever that was? Listen, and, and she obeyed. A woman in the 1940s preaching the gospel? Oh, yeah, amen. I'm with that. Comes down to the valley and starts a revival. Just opens up a tent and starts having services. This is during the time of the healing revival. And people started getting healed. People started coming out of wheelchairs. People started coming out of walkers, throwing away their crutches, getting set free from alcohol, getting set free from all kinds of things and addictions. And the power of God was so moving in that area, they just kept on having service. For two years, they had service every day. 365 years. And that movement, Alyssa to me, was so great that they started a church called Revival Center. It's this church. I was thinking, you know, here's what God said to me. This church was born out of the spirit of faith. Somebody believed the spirit of God prompted on the inside. And they spoke and said, I'll do it, I'll go. And she came and she went. And, and she, the power of God fell in this place. And then if you look at the over the years, this church became fairly large. At one point um, in the 80s, it was 1,500 people. 
and, and, and things were going really well. They had a, they had a, it was called Church of the Good Shepherd at that time. And, and then things started falling apart. Now, I'm, there's a reason I'm sharing this with you. Things started falling apart. People started being people. And they started getting mad at each other. I know that's never happened in a church you've been in. And they started getting mad at each other. They, they, they kicked out the pastor. Literally, in 1995 or somewhere in there, this church was down to 60 people. Their worship leader was 80 years old. Now, now listen, I'm not saying, if you're 80, there's nothing wrong with that, but you shouldn't be a worship leader. All right? Not that age. You know, and, and they, they had gone through three or four pastors. The, the average length of stay for a pastor was six months. If you looked at this church in, in 1995, literally, if you would look at it through the, the eyes of church growth, you know, um, wisdom, you would never come to this church. Never. And I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm just doing this little thing with youth ministry, and God speaks to me and says, you know what? Your time of youth ministry is ending. You, you need to move on. It took a year for that to happen. I was just like, okay, God, where do you want me to move? And, and, and it came across somebody's desk that there was an opening here in the Rio Grande Valley, 60 people, 80-year-old worship leader. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Messed up, bored that you would never want to be under. And my wife, I remember I wasn't going to come down here. I was like, I don't know. Uh. My wife said, it'll be fun. Just let's just go. I didn't know God was using her like that. <laughs> and I got on a plane and we flew from Tulsa to Houston. Then from Houston, I'll never forget it. We were flying and I, I, for, I, know, I don't even like a window seat, but for some reason I'm in the window seat. And, and, I, and the, you know, the, the shade's up and I'm just praying in the spirit. I'm just like, God, all right, you know, I'm going to try out for this church's pastor. I don't even know if really want, even want to go. And I'm looking across and I'm, I'm from Cali, mountains. You know what I'm talking about? Like 10,000 foot, 12,000 foot mountains. My wife, she's from West Virginia. They have hills. She says they're mountains, but they're hills. All right. And, 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 and I look out the window and the land, I mean, there's not a, it's flat. Like there's not a bump anywhere. And I'm like, oh my God, because there was no clouds. I wish there would have been. And, and, and I'm like, God, what, where am I going? Now listen to me, but listen to me, but listen to me. This is so important. I'm not just telling a story, but something went off right here. There was a spark. I knew I was supposed to be here. I got out. It was 89 degrees in December. <laughs> I don't like the heat. It's flat. I don't like the heat. I really not really wanting to go to a border town but there's a there's a pool on the inside come on and I spoke and watched the 80 year old guy lead worship I I was a youth pastor at a church of 5,000 I mean worked in a church of 5,000 we had great worship I'm looking at all this I'm called the family ministry and it, there there's like two kids in the whole place because everybody's over 60, 70, 80. There might have been a 90-year-old in the crowd. And I'm thinking, God, that, this doesn't make sense. All my friends who came and, and, and spoke at the church after I became the pastor said, you'll never make it. They didn't say it to my face. They just thought as they walked, he'll never make it. But, there's, but listen, there was a spirit of faith that came on me because God said it. I believed it. I spoke it and I did it. Come on now. Now, now. Over the years, you know, Terry and I go to church conferences. I don't even like going to them anymore. We go to church conferences and people hear our story. And some of our friends will tell other people, oh, you got to meet these guys. They were in a church that was 60 and, and nobody should have gone to that church and God turned it around. And everybody comes up to me and goes, how did you do it? Because they're all trying to figure out how to do it. How did you do it? How did you do it? And I've never had an answer, but I do now. Because here's what God said to me. He says, this church was birthed 
by the spirit of faith. Listen to me. Not, and, and by a woman. I love that. Why do we have so many women that are anointed by God? My wife and many others. Why is it? Because it was birthed by a woman. Think about that. It was birthed. It, it and almost died. It was, it was on life support. What raised it up? Was it because I have a great skill set? No. I was insignificant. I don't have a whole lot of talents and gifts, but I know one thing. I know how to believe God. And, 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 I, and God said it was resurrected by the spirit of faith. Now, I want you to hear this. That spirit is on this church. See, and we have a decision what we're going to do with it as a church individual as a as a, a congregation and then we each every one of us have a decision what we're going to do with the spirit of faith but one day this church is going to be passed on to the next generation and, and this is what god said to me it was born in the spirit of faith it was resurrected in the spirit of faith and it'll be passed on to the next generation by the spirit of faith now why do i say that if you consider this church home, this is your legacy. Yes. See, there's some of you right now, you're in the middle of something. There's areas of your life that are on life support. And God's saying, it's time for you to begin to operate in the spirit of faith. I almost feel like I'm prophesying to you. It's time for you to begin to speak what the Bible says about it and not what you see and what you feel. There's some of you that need to push back against fear. You need to push back against the power of darkness that's stealing and ripping you off and shredding you. See, we're, we're, there's something about this generation. We become victims to everything that happens. Everything that happens, it's poor me. Oh my, how am I gonna get to the other side? Does anybody care? Listen, that's not what gets you to the other side. Crying and sobbing and whining before God does not move God. What moves God is the spirit of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:4, without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. We must believe, we must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, some of you are going through things and you're like, oh, it's time to stop crying. It's time to stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's time, it's time to stop talking about the problem and start talking about the answer and start believing God. <laughs> Listen to me. I believe in this place that God wants to do miracles. He wants to heal people who've been given a death sentence. He wants to see people whose families are shredded and that God wants to restore marriages, bring kids back to God. See, people have gone through all kinds of abuse and terror to, to be restored to peace and joy and love. What does it? The spirit of faith. What moves God? The spirit of faith. What brings joy and peace and love into our life? The spirit of faith. I can literally be in a situation and, and I'm bummed. The situation's like coming in on me and I feel like there's no way out and I'm feeling all this emotional upheaval and the moment I start believing and start speaking, the entire environment around me changes. When you start talking doubt and unbelief, you're gonna have the spirit of fear. But when you start talking who God is, if, if nothing else, if you don't know anything else, just know I know God's for me. If, if I don't know any other scripture, I know he's good. I know he's faithful. I know he's never forsaken me. If nothing, man, that'll cheer you up. But you know what? It's a battle. It's a fight. And the whole world is wired so you won't do that. The whole world, the culture of this world is for you to be in fear and to be intimidated. Faith is not intimidated. Faith offends people. Faith stands when other people will doubt. When other people are speaking doubt and unbelief, they get offended by your faith. How dare you believe God? You fool, call me a fool all you want, but I'm gonna believe him till I die. Listen, I, I got about four hours of this stuff if you wanna hang around. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, 
I mean, I mean, God's been speaking to me. I personally believe this is the message for the rest of my life, the spirit of faith. It doesn't mean every Sunday we're going to talk about it, but I believe it's so powerful. Let, 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 me, let me close with a story that I believe will encourage you. You know, there's a story about the Israelites and, and, and Judah especially was, was thrown into captivity to Babylon because of their sin. And so they're underneath this Babylonian regime. And, and, and at this time for this story, they're underneath a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is at this point not a believer and he, he serves idols and he creates this huge golden idol and, and he makes this statement as this, this idol, as people gather around this idol, that they're going to play music and as they play music, everybody has to bow down to the idol. And if you don't bow down to the idol, then they're going to throw you into a fiery furnace. How many of you know that's not good? And, and they're going to throw, him into a, throw you into a fiery furnace. Because let me tell you, the spirit of darkness always intimidates. And all of a sudden, the news comes to the king that there's these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abandigo. And, and they're not bowing. See, the spirit of faith does not bow. It doesn't bow to fear. It doesn't bow to intimidation. It doesn't bow. They don't bow. The king's told. He's, he's upset. He brings the three Hebrew boys in. And he's going to talk to him. And we're going to pick this up in Daniel 3.15. I don't know if we have it on the screen or not. But it says this. I will give you. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Now listen to this part. And And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. What a statement. See, that wasn't really a statement just from Nebuchadnezzar. That's a statement heard throughout generation to generation to generation when darkness moves into your life and it says, what God will deliver you from the power of sickness? What God will deliver you from the power of your family curse? What will deliver you from your past? What will deliver you? See, and most people would have been in that situation. They'll be like, oh, you know what? I better bow. You know, I have to succumb because God doesn't want me to die. God doesn't want me to go through this. They start reasoning out, but not these boys. All right, great. There we go. Of course, my... There we go. All right. But here, here's, their, here's their answer. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. Now, I want you to hear. This is the spirit of faith. It is bold. It is in your face. It says, O Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the, he's the, this guy is the most powerful man on the planet. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. In other words, we're not going to give you. We're not going to defend ourselves. We stand on what we believe. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to serve, save us. Now listen to this. He will rescue us from your power. I mean, he's just right back in their face. Listen, God will rescue us from the power of darkness. That was their statement. Now, you know, that had to tick off the king. And some of you are like, yeah, but what if he doesn't? What if I believe and he doesn't? This is what their answer was. Look at what they said. But even if he doesn't, we, won't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue which you have set up. Amen. See, I, I didn't say this in the first service, but I think this is so good. When the spirit of faith is full in your life, you're willing to die for it. Well, this did not make the king happy at all. He, he was ticked. He was, the Bible says he was furious. When you look at that word up, I believe, if I remember correctly, I mean, he is out of control. He basically tells them to heat up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. They bind up the three Hebrew boys. The men grab them. They go to throw them in the furnace. The fire is so hot that the guys who throw them in the furnace get burned up. Now, they're, they're tied up. They throw them in. And all of a sudden, the king looks. 
And they're standing. In case you're wondering, if somebody throws you in a fiery furnace, you don't stand. You're burned up. They're not. They're standing. And the king goes, look, look, they're standing. And there's a fourth man. Come on now. There's the fourth man wants to move in your life. And he says, he's like the son of God. And, and, and I love this. I love this. Let, let's read this. Okay, I, it's Daniel 3.27. And it said the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. Now listen to this. And they saw the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. The spirit of darkness had no power. Why? Because the spirit of faith is greater. Would you stand to your feet all over the building right now? Listen, I'm, I'm here to declare the spirit of faith before you. I, I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your past is. I don't know whether you're little, big, in the eyes of people. What's important is the spirit of faith. What will change your life is a spirit of faith. What will take and begin to feel the presence of God in your life is the, is the spirit of faith. But it's your decision. See, my job, I just give you the word. Then you have to make a decision. What do you do with it? I believe the power of God's in this room today. I believe the power of God is here to heal people, to move on people's lives. Let me, let me share something real quick, okay? I'm going to go a little bit, a little bit longer. There's a story in the Bible. I'm, I'll make it real short. But do but you remember the story where the, the, the kid, the guy that was lame and he was on a cot and they, went, they put him on the roof and they had to open up the roof and put him down? All right, he got healed. Jesus forgave his sin and he healed him. Before all that happens, you have to understand there's a whole bunch of people in the room. And the Bible says the power of God was there to heal them. But only one guy got healed. Why? Only one guy Move with the spirit of faith. See, you're in this room. There's several things. Number one, you're, you don't know you're right with God. The spirit of faith will change your life 100%. When I was 16 years old, I heard about a message like this, and all of a sudden, I made a decision. And, and I'm, I accepted Jesus Christ as my, the Lord of my life. You know how you get saved? You believe in your heart, and you speak with your mouth. You believe that Jesus was raised from the dead that he paid for all of your sin. And then you speak it with your mouth. And the Bible says the moment that you do that, the spirit of faith comes on you. It forgives you of every sin you've ever done in your life. He comes to live on the inside of you, to be your life partner, and heaven's your eternal home. That, that miracle happens immediately the moment you speak it. Yes. And, and see, you may be here today, and you've never accepted Jesus, so for the first time you need to. Or maybe you're here and say, Pastor, one time I accepted Jesus, but I've fallen away from God. Listen, today's your day. All I, here's what all I'm asking. If that spark of hope is moving in your life, respond. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If that's you, you need to come to God for the first time or come back to him all over the building. Just want you to put your hand up nice and high. Yeah, hands going up. Hands going up. I'm not even going to try to count them. That's awesome. That's awesome. More people that need to get baptized. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. I want everybody to look at me. We are not just repeating a prayer. Yeah. We're speaking words empowered by the spirit of faith that transform. And from this day forward, we, after we say this prayer, you make a decision and say, my life's different. It won't always feel different. You'll make mistakes and you'll blow it. Here's the thing I know. You know what? God's more concerned about the spirit of faith rather than, than if you mess up here and there. It's the spirit of faith that changes you. It'll get you corrected. It'll get you right. But today, as we speak these words over these people, a miracle's going to happen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that old things are passed away. And, the, and literally it says you're going to be a new creation. A new creation. 
So I want to, I'm going to lead you out in a prayer. I want everybody in the room to repeat this prayer nice and loud. Those folks who raise their hands, when you say these words, speak them. Believe. Believe. Speak. And as you do, a miracle will happen. He'll forgive you, come to live in you, and heaven's your eternal home. Everybody repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus, that he died for me. I repent of my old life, and I ask you to come into my heart and to save me right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. I thank you because of my confession that I am forgiven, that you live in me, that heaven's my eternal home. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for those who receive Christ.